Now let's start the video quiz. For each of these problems, pause the video and work on it. Once you have your answer, unpause it to see the solution. So let's go ahead and begin. For number one, if we plug in two, notice that we will get four in the bottom. We won't get a zero in the denominator of the fraction. So therefore, we can use direct substitution to get the answer. So let's replace x with two. So it's going to be two squared plus seven times two plus six divided by two plus two. Now, two squared is four. Seven times two is 14 plus six and two plus two is four. Now, four 14 plus 6 is 20, and 20 plus 4, that's 24, and 24 divided by, that number was supposed to be 4, 24 divided by 4 is 6, so this is the value of the limit, which means that answer choice B is the correct answer. Number 2, find the value of the limit shown below. Now, if we try to use direct substitution, in the denominator, we're going to get 0. So we don't want to do that. What we need to do is factor. So how can we factor the numerator? What two numbers multiply to negative 15 but add to the middle coefficient of positive 2? This is going to be positive 5 and negative 3. So to factor it, it's going to be x plus 5 times x minus 3. Now on the bottom, we can factor x squared minus 9 because they're perfect squares. The square root of x squared is x, and the square root of 9 is 3. One of them is going to be plus, the other is going to be minus. Notice that we can cancel x minus 3. So now we can evaluate the limit as x approaches 3 of x plus 5 divided by x plus 3. So it's going to be 3 plus 5 divided by 3 plus 3, and so that's 8 divided by 6, which reduces to 4 divided by 3 if you divide both numbers by 2. So therefore, D is the right answer. Number 3, calculate the value of the limit shown below. So whenever you have a complex fraction, what you want to do is multiply the top and the bottom by the common denominator, the common denominator being 4x. So on the top, you want to distribute. 4x times 1 over x is 4. 4x is the same as 4x over 1. And you can see the x variables will cancel, leaving behind 4. So therefore, what we now have is the limit as x approaches 4. And on top, we have positive 4. Now, if we multiply 4x by 1 over 4, you can see that the 4's will cancel, leaving behind x. And there's a negative sign in front, so it's going to be minus x. And on the bottom, we're just going to rewrite x minus 4 and 4 minus x. Now, these two factors look very similar, but they're not exactly the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to factor out a negative 1. If we do so, negative x will change into positive x, and positive 4 will change into negative 4. And it's at this point that we can get rid of the x minus 4. So now we have the limit as x approaches 4 of negative 1 divided by 4x. Now we can use direct substitution. So this is going to be negative 1 over 4 times 4, which gives us a final answer of negative 1 divided by 16, which means c is the right answer. Number 4. Find the value of the limit. So here we have a rational function with a square root on the top. In a situation like this, you need to multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate of the numerator. The conjugate is going to be the same thing, but you've got to change the negative sign into a positive sign. And whatever you do to the top, you must also do to the bottom. Now on top, we're going to FOIL. The square root of x times the square root of x is equal to x. The square root of x times 4, that's going to be positive 4 square root x. And negative 4 times the square root of x is going to be what you see here. 
And finally, we have negative 4 times 4, which is negative 16. In the denominator, we're not going to FOIL. We're just going to rewrite what we have. So we can see that the two middle terms add up to 0, and they're going to disappear. So now what we have is the limit as x approaches 16 of x minus 16 divided by x minus 16 times the square root of x plus 4. So now we can cancel x minus 16. And at this point, we can replace x with 16. So this is going to be 1 divided by the square root of 16 plus 4. The square root of 16 is 4, and 4 plus 4 is 8. So the answer is 1 divided by 8, which corresponds to answer choice A. Number 5. Evaluate the limit. So we can't plug in 7. If we plug in 7, it's going to be 0 over 0, which is indeterminate. And we don't know if that's equal to 0, infinity, doesn't exist, or 1 or negative 1. So we need to check the left side and the right side of the limit. So let's start with the left side, as x approaches 7 from the left. Let's call this f of x. So we're going to substitute a number that's close to 7, but from the left. Let's use 6.9. 6.9 minus 7 is negative 0.1. And the absolute value of negative 0.1 is positive 0.1. And when you divide that by negative 0.1, you're going to get negative 1. So therefore, that is the limit as x approaches 7 from the left side. It's equal to negative 1. Now what about from the right side? What is the limit as x approaches 7 from the right side? So let's plug in a number that's greater than 7 but close to it. Let's try 7.1. So 7.1 minus 7 is equal to positive 0.1. And the absolute value of positive 0.1 is positive 0.1. Divided by itself, that's going to equal positive 1. So notice that the left side and the right side do not match. So therefore, the limit does not exist, which means E is the answer. Number 6. What is the value of the limit of the trigonometric function shown below? So just by looking at it, it's going to be 3 divided by 5, for those of you who just want a quick answer. So it turns out answer choice B is the right answer, but let's do some work to get our answer. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to replace tangent with sine divided by cosine. So tan 3x is sine 3x divided by cosine 3x. And we still have this 5x on the bottom, so I can write it as 1 over 5x. Now, what I need to have under sine 3x is a 3x. I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by 3. So I'm going to trade places with the cosine and the 3. And I'm also going to move the x in that position as well. So this is all equal to the limit as x approaches 0, sine 3x divided by 3x times the limit as x approaches 0. I still have a 3 on top. And I already moved the 3x to the left. So on the bottom, I have a 5 and a cosine 3x, which I'm going to write as 1 over cosine 3x. So now I'm going to use substitution. Let's say that y is equal to 3x. So therefore, this limit expression becomes the following expression. The limit as y approaches 0 of sine y divided by y times the limit as x approaches 0. And here, this is a function based on x. So this is going to be 1 over cosine. 3x times 3 over 5. Now the limit as y approaches 0 of sine y divided by y, that's equal to 1. You just need to know that formula. 
you can always plug in a small value of x, and you can confirm that it's 1. Cosine 0, if we replace x with 0, 3 times 0 is still 0. Cosine 0 is equal to 1, but I'll replace that in the next step. So what we have is 1 times 1 times 3 over 5, which gives us a final answer of 3 divided by 5. So therefore, answer choice B is the right answer. Number 7. Find the horizontal asymptote of the function shown below using limits. To do so, we need to find the limit as x approaches infinity of the function 5x plus 8x squared divided by 3x plus 2x squared plus 5. Now keep in mind, when x becomes very large, 5x is insignificant compared to 8x squared. If you replace x with 1,000, 5,000 is not significant to 8 million. And 3 is not significant to 2 million. So therefore, this expression becomes equivalent to the limit as x approaches infinity of 8x squared divided by 2x squared plus 5. You can only do this when x becomes very large. Mathematically, it works out. 8 divided by 2 is 4. And you can cancel the x squares because they're the same. So what we now have is 4 plus 5, which is equal to 9. So therefore, 9 is the final answer. And that's going to be the horizontal asymptote. It's an equation, and y equals 9. So e is the right answer. Number 8. Which of the following is equivalent to the limit shown below? So go ahead, take a minute, and try this problem. Now what you need to know is that the sine function oscillates between 1 and negative 1. This is the graph of sine x. Now the only difference between sine x and sine 1 over x is how fast it oscillates. As you approach an x value of 0, it begins to oscillate faster and faster. However, the amplitude still varies between 1 and negative 1. So it really doesn't matter the angle or the fact that we have a 1 over x within sine. Because as x approaches 0, 1 over x does not exist. As x approaches 0 from the left, 1 over x becomes negative infinity. And as x approaches 0 from the right, 1 over x becomes positive infinity. But that doesn't matter for the sine function, because it's always going to alternate between negative 1 and 1. So we can make this statement. Sine of 1 over x will always be between negative 1 and 1. Now, if we multiply everything by x, we can get this expression. Negative x is between sine, is between x sine 1 over x, and it's between positive x. So x sine 1 over x is between negative x and positive x. That's what I meant to say. Now, what we can use is the squeeze term. So basically, the squeeze term states that, let's call this uh, h of x, and let's say f of x is between h of x and g of x. If the limit as x approaches 0 of h of x and g of x, if they're the same, then the limit as x approaches f of x must also be the same. So that's the main idea behind the squeeze term. So the limit as x approaches 0 for h of x, which is really negative x, well, that's equal to 0. Now, the limit as x approaches 0 of g of x, which in this case is positive x, that too is equal to 0. So therefore, the limit as x approaches x sine of 1 over x, since it's between negative x and x, it too must also equal 0. So therefore, b is the right answer, according to the squeeze term. Number 9. Verify that the intermediate value theorem applies to the indicated interval and find the value of c guaranteed by the theorem. So, based on the intermediate value theorem, you need to know that it states that f has to be continuous on the closed interval a to b, 
and that f of a cannot equal f of b. And there is some number k which is between f of a and f of b such that f of c is equal to k and c has to be in the interval of a and b. So we got to find that value of c such that k is between f of a and f of b. Notice that we have the value of k. k is whatever number f of c is equal to so therefore k is 0. So first we got to show that f of a and f of b well we have to show that 0 is between f of a and f of b. We have to prove that the IVT term applies. So let's find f of a where a is uh, 0 and b is 2. So f of 0 is going to be 0 squared plus 4 times 0 minus 5. So f of 0 is negative 5. Now let's calculate f of b which is f of 2. So that's going to be 2 squared plus 4 times 2 minus 5. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. 4 plus 8 is 12 minus 5, that's 7. So the intermediate value theorem does apply to the indicated interval. As we can see, k, which is 0, is in between negative 5 and 7. So now that we know that the IVT theorem applies, we can now find the value of c. So let's set f of c equal to 0. So basically, set the function f of x, replace it with 0, and find the value of x. So 0 is equal to x squared plus 4x minus 5. Now we need to factor. Two numbers that multiply to negative 5 but add to positive 4 are positive 5 and negative 1. Therefore, we can see that x is equal to negative 5 and positive 1 if you reverse the signs. If you set x plus 5 equal to 0, x will equal negative 5. And if you set x minus 1 equal to 0, x will equal positive 1. Now, one of these values is the c value that we're looking for. So c has to be in the interval a to b, that is between 0 and 2. Negative 5 is not between 0 and 2, but 1 is. So therefore, c is equal to 1, which means d is the right answer. Number 10. Find the value of c that will make the function continuous at x equals 2. The first thing we need to do is set these two functions equal to each other. So 7x squared plus cx is equal to 2x cubed plus 5c plus 3. Now, we need to find the value of c when x is 2. So let's replace x with 2. And then after that, all we have to do is just algebra. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 7 is 28. 2 to the third is 8 times 2 is 16. So now let's subtract both sides by 2c. So these will cancel. On the left we have 28. And we can combine like terms. 16 plus 3 is 19. And 5c minus 2c is 3c. Now let's subtract both sides by 19. 28 minus 19 is 9. So 9 is equal to 3c. So if we divide both sides by 3, we can see that c is 9 divided by 3, which is 3. And that is the answer. So answer choice c is correct.